sense, is this helpful information to you? It, it's cramming 200 years of Indian law and more than 30 years of Indian child welfare into a very short training, and I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you. Um, if you have questions later on, or if you run into a case later on where you find a question, please feel free to call me. I, I accept um, phone calls from service coordinators, attorneys, judges, um, case managers, anybody that has a question about the Indian Child Welfare Act. If you're a service coordinator um, and you call me, I may ask that we do a conference call with the case manager um, or if you send an email and you're a service coordinator, if you send an email to me, you might want to include the case manager on that email. Um, I want to make sure that we're, that everybody's on the same page about equal compliance and, and what we should be doing. Anybody have any questions now? Yes. Is there a um, place you can go to learn more about the Indian culture and their sensitivities? And um, <clears throat> what I have done and what I've found very helpful is to work within tribal cultures on a tribe's reservation, have direct contact. I very often work, mo most often, with the Omaha, Winnebago, Santi Sioux, and Ponca tribes because I'm also the tribal liaison and I'm responsible for the child welfare agreements. And if I have a question, I ask in the Child Protective Services Office or I ask the ICWA specialist. Um, Shirley Badwood is with us. I hope you don't mind me recognizing her. Shirley is um, the ICWA specialist from the Rosebud Sioux tribe, Bernadette. Um, with Shirley, also works with Shirley. Are there any other tribal employees, tribal members here today? I think a big part of trainings is networking. And when you get <coughs> face with a name, it's really important. It's crucial to the work that we do. It's so much easier to pick up that phone. If I know that Shirley's on the other end of the phone, I know who I'm talking to. Um, more work gets done networking and trainings than, than the information that's trained very often. Shelly. Thank you, Sherry. I'd like to um, also add, depending on where you live, I'm really amazed when I ask questions like, <clears throat> my daughter's a traditional dancer, so sometimes we'll go to um, Sioux Falls or, you know, and, and or, or we're really in, or we'll say, um, we'll be in a store, for instance, and then someone may ask, you know, trying to be friendly and you know, what are you here for? And I'm always amazed that people that live right, uh, I don't know how many, oh, I'll, ask, I'll ask first, how many of you are from this area right here? You're within the Rosebud Sioux Reservation. And how many of you have gone to the annual, um, our annual Wachibi Fair in August? See, that, that, I mean, that's just right there. You know, that's, it's like we come here to attend your fair or your carnival or your rodeo celebrations, you know? That's just right over there. What, I don't know how many minutes drive, maybe 40 minutes drive. And then we have that the third weekend of the August. Every tribe has that. That's kind of the historical. We always had that. Uh, probably when I was a little girl and I lived in North of Allen, I would remember getting um, into a car and camping. And Pine Ridge was only probably about, uh, I don't know, maybe 40, 50 miles away. And we went and camped there for like five days for the, for the annual celebration. It was kind of like a reunion time. So, you know, and, and the colleges have a lot of events. So I always tell people now you can get on the internet or yeah, you can call us or look at the local newspaper, you know, but there, we do have a lot of regular, and each community on the reservation has their annual fair also. So if someone is from <coughs> Allen or Kyle or Parmalee, you know, you can always ask, you know, and, and, and you can attend those. And we're very open to that. But um, I also wanted to add on here that um, on that enrollment, when you guys are doing the enrollment piece, we really need uh, birthdays. We need birthdays, like some of our enrollment records, some of them have been missed, and I never realized that their database is really tied into the birthdays. <coughs> so we really need that, even if mom and dad and grab them as far as back to get to get correct. Some of, some of them that enrollment done has been missed because the birthdays were on there. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to add that on there, and then, um, the, in, you know, I wanted to ask a question too, Sherry, about eligibility um, in the ICWA law. We're not attorneys, you know, I'm just a social worker slash advocate, so I get asked a lot of heavy duty questions and I always ask parents, you have an attorney, but most of the time they want to listen to that attorney. Or the attorney doesn't have time for them, I don't know what the reason for that is, but they'll call us and then, you know, because we, we want 
then we get that into video. And the only of court, I don't think, when you get assigned an attorney, if I'm correct. But what I know on that, um, for equal eligibility, um, if the parent, the parent, the, what we've always been told is that a parent has to be a lower eligible of the child. That's and, a tribal determination. And we yes. also just went to lineal descendancy, so we have a lot of parents that. Uh, it used to be one fourth degree, so a lot of them are right on that border and not eligible, but the parent hasn't enrolled. And we got challenged by a county attorney, and, I mean, not in court, but he just called us up and and uh, he was asking us about that. And it takes about 10 months to a year for someone to get eligible in the process. So I wanted to bring that out too, that <coughs> um, so, you know, if the parent isn't enrolled and just a grandparent, would that still be considered it for the courts? It depends on the tribe. If the tribe says that the child is a member of the tribe, then it will applies to that child. It's a tribal determination as far as tribal membership. So if the tribe says yes, the child is a member, and it's a child custody proceeding, then it, it, it is an equal case. Our pending letter said eligible. She didn't say okay. the, the, the pending letter from the enrollment said the, parent, the child is eligible only I mean, if the father or mother submits an application. So they're kind of looking at it as okay. eligible. It's not official. That cursory review, the, and mm -hmm. they said they never undone one, but it's just to go through all the <coughs> you know, the committee and then to go to the council and get a number. Mm -hmm. So you know, kind of that beginning phase, they do determine the eligible numbers. But that so, application has to be submitted on Ohio. Okay. And every tribe is unique in their eligibility and membership determinations. And I, I'm glad you brought up blood quantum. There was some one other thing that I wanted to add about blood quantum. Um, tribes can and do change their enrollment or their membership criteria. That's the right of a sovereign nation. But for those tribes who, who have a blood quantum requirement, those blood quantums are not always accurately uh, calculated. I've been involved in cases involving the Omaha tribe uh, for members of the Omaha tribe, it was a federal government employee who made the determination of blood <coughs> quantum very often in the early 1900s or the late 1800s. Sometimes those calculations are wrong. And then you have those tribes who have blood quantum requirements for membership, and because paternity has not been acknowledged or established, only mom's blood quantum is considered. Well, if you have paternity that's established, all of a sudden you have dad's blood quantum. So a child may not be eligible for membership with just moms, and later on down the road, if you add dad's blood quantum, the child may be eligible, or may be considered a member. So we need to ask in every case, and we need to ask continuously, if you have three children and a tribe has responded that no, they're not eligible for membership, and three years later a new baby is born, we need to ask the tribe about that new baby as well, because tribes can change their membership criteria. Um, yes. The other part too is dual enrollment. We don't have dual enrollment. Okay. I think at one time we used to have like a Chippewa father lunch enroll, and we found some of those, mm -hmm. and those have to be decided which tribe is going to be going to be connected to. Yes. We always, we always like to look at the best interest of the child if it's going to be a member of a Connecticut tribe. We'd rather be then be a member of Connecticut rather than Rosa. I haven't had any like that. You know, I mean, and we don't all get per capita, we all don't get money. That's another thing I call on and I get serious on because I want to ask that person who's asking to come out here and visit us in South Dakota. I have a good friend who says that she goes to her mailbox every day and she hasn't found a, a check from her tribe in, in the mailbox yet. Um, per capita payments are made on a tribal basis depending on the tribe's resources. Some tribes have those resources. Um, I've worked with cases where tribal members receive $36,000 every six months just because they were tribal members. Some tribes have resources. We want to be very careful that we protect those relationships for that child. It may mean a lifetime of Indian health services. It may mean a lifetime of, of tribal per capita payments. It may mean tuition-free education at a state-sponsored university. State of Maine, the state where I grew up, if you are a member of a federally recognized tribe whose governmental headquarters are within the state of Maine, you have tuition-free um, education at the University of Maine system. Huge when you're talking about a kid who, who's grown up in foster care and who wants to, to uh, attend post-secondary education. Those benefits, we need to be able to protect them for Indian children. Um, 
Shirley mentioned dual enrollment. Most tribes have codes or laws that <coughs> prohibit dual enrollment. They prohibit enrollment in more than one tribe. But if we have a child who is eligible for membership in more than one tribe, from the department's perspective, we want to have both or all tribes involved. That's more resources that may be available to the tribe. There is no reason why the department should have to choose one tribe over the other. A state court judge can limit intervention to only one tribe, and we'll talk about intervention and transfer, and a case can be transferred to only one tribal court. But for purposes of ongoing child custody proceedings, if we have more than one tribe involved, more than one tribe can intervene in the proceedings, more than one tribe can have a voice in those proceedings. Um, other questions? I yes. wanted to add to, <clears throat> to really work hard at the beginning of the case to know who the family are. Absolutely. To really get names, addresses. It's like yeah. really frustrating um, <clears throat> when, it, when it's at the 11th hour and I get a call and say, Shirley, do you have any families out there that claim to, you know, I'm sitting in a desk and um, we mentioned uh, we have a minimum of 225 cases nationwide. And um, then on top of that, we get on an average of about probably mm -hmm. Hundred uh, notices that we have to respond that are, are truly non-eligible. You know, everybody wants. I mean, it's kind of kind of frightening to get those, and you know they're non-eligible. But you get the letter from enrollment. We don't do our own determination. We give it to enrollment to get letters from them, and then see that adds to their work of what they do. And we've been so bombarded with this lineal descendancy. Um, it's just been overwhelming. No one here with any extra staff. You know, and, and in some of those cases that were all were. Um, there are almost more determination that the courts do, or the families, the attorneys, do want them to be recognized as equals they have to be to be part of it. It's just really, that 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 would really save, you know, if you have, a, even if things are going to pay to do that, make that practice to get all those parties <coughs> involved so that you kind of see if you're going to have, a, you know, have to have more relatives come forward, that you mm -hmm. kind of done that homework. Because I haven't had a whole lot of them, but in the beginning, I've been there for almost 10 years, we did have families coming at the eleventh hour and saying, "That is my son's child. My son's deceased, and we pulled out the notice, and there was no uh, the names were all you know they, they weren't in there, mm -hmm. and had to get that. You know, had to rush down to Lincoln, and all the families showed up, you know, and then it's those, those cases get really high emotions. They do, because we're dealing with people's lives." children's lives, parents' lives, grandparents' lives, and their connections to their, to their family and, and um, their tribes. Emergency removals. Um, the Indian Child Welfare Act allows, <laughs> us, allows law enforcement uh, in Nebraska to remove children who are resident or domiciled on a reservation or wards of a tribal court in an emergency to prevent imminent physical damage or harm to the child. Emergency is imminent physical damage or harm. So the, the grandparent from Scotts Bluff who allowed her children to return to their mother's care in Scotts Bluff, law enforcement could remove their children based upon that emergency. The state court didn't have jurisdiction. When the emergency ends, depending on the situation, if we have a child who is not resident or domiciled on a reservation or a ward of the tribal court, the state can initiate a child custody proceeding or if the child is a ward of the tribal court or resident or domiciled on the reservation, transfer the child to the tribe. That's picking up a phone call and, and, and saying, you know, mom went out and she got drunk in Scott's Bluff and there's nobody to care for the child. You need to come get the children or the child. Um, or return the child to the parent or the Indian custodian. And that's a provision that's placed in there under the recognition that you may have mom and dad who live in Pine Ridge and they're driving down I-80 in Nebraska and they're in a car accident. Mom and dad go to the hospital, there's no one to care for the children, but mom's released from the hospital the next morning. We return the child to the parent or Indian custodian. We never compromise safety to comply with the Indian Child Welfare Act. We're not going to place a child in an unsafe, what we deem an unsafe <coughs> situation. So we may need to litigate on whether a home is safe or unsafe. But for emergency removal purposes, ICWA standard is imminent physical damage or harm to the child. If we do not have imminent physical damage or harm to the child, the state must first initiate a child custody proceeding, and the burdens of proof 
and the expert witness testimony has to occur prior to the, the child's removal. The dirty house cases in Douglas County, where, where the court says there is no imminent physical danger to the child. Those are the cases where, where we need to have the petition filed. We need to have a qualified expert witness testimony prior to the child's removal. Placement preferences. For foster care and pre-adoptive placements, they need to be the least restrictive setting, most like a family in which a child's special needs, if any, may be met, within reasonable proximity to the home. There is a good cause exception to the placement preferences, and the tribe may adopt different preferences. There is a tribe in California where every time one of their, it's, it, the tribe's children comes in, into a child custody proceeding, a state child custody proceeding, they pass a resolution that has the specific people that they want that child placed with. Grandma first, uh, auntie or uncle second, uh, band or clan member third, and it's done for every child that comes into care. Doesn't happen very often. Usually we follow the Indian Child Welfare Act. Placement preferences. For foster care and pre-adoptive placement, and for adoptive placement, the number one placement preference is always with extended family. Indian or non-Indian, extended family of the child. If we have an Indian relative and a non-Indian relative who can provide care for the child, who is best able to meet that child's needs? Extended family is extended family. The second place, placement preference, a foster home licensed, approved, or specified by the child's tribe, we don't know if the tribe has a home that's licensed, approved, or specified unless we reach out and make that contact with the tribe. Call the tribal local specialist and see if they have a home available. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. An Indian foster home licensed or approved by an authorized non-Indian licensing authority, Boys and Girls Home Licensing, KVC, um, NFC in Douglas County, Omaha. Um, we do have Cedar, well, we do have Cedars licensed homes through June 30th, Visnet homes, they're licensed homes that are Native American homes. I have heard recently about a couple of Native homes um, that are not listed as Native homes on Enfocus because they receive <coughs> eight or ten phone calls every Friday night and every Saturday night saying, can you take more children into your home? And their response is, no, our home is full. We just can't do it. We don't have enough Native American foster homes. Um, the fourth placement preference is an institution for children approved by the tribe or operated by an Indian organization with a program suitable to meet the child's needs. The Omaha tribe has Mark of Honor um, emergency shelter and now they have licensed group home beds. The Winnebago Youth Facil Facility is an emergency shelter. I know that the Iguala Sioux tribe has an emergency shelter. Rosewood too, Shirley? Um, do you have an emergency? Yeah, we do. Okay. Um, so, if, especially if we have a case where we're doing background checks on family members, if we need placement for an Indian child for two or three days, I know that the Omaha and Winnebago tribes shelters will accept children from all federally recognized tribes. I believe that, that Juanita Sherrick, um, the director of OnTrack, told me that they would also accept children from all federally recognized tribes in their emergency shelter. Um, Rosebud? The, the issue that, we, I don't think we've ever, ever we, Ever use them? Um, the issue is always where the parents live. If they're like mm -hmm. in Sioux Falls, they kind of want them closer. Mm -hmm. We do propose that, but um, for some, unless you have a family that's going to get cleared that lives right down the reservation. Mm -hmm. But usually, um, I don't think we. Uh, I, I'm not sure if we use them. We don't use them very often at all. Okay. And Health and Human Services has placed children <coughs> on reservations, even out of state reservations. Um, if, you, if you know of family members who are available for placement out of state and you're, you're working for HHS or you're a service coordinator, get the ICPC process started as soon as you possibly can. If we're dealing with a reservation, uh, and we may not have to apply ICPC, we need to take that on a case-by-case -case basis, please call me if you have any questions about ICPC. Um, if you need an expedite, expedited ICPC, um, I work with Rita Kruzmark and <coughs> Mary Dyer in the Lincoln office. They are the ICPC administrators for Nebraska, and they work with all 50 states. 
um, we may be able to get things going a little bit more, more quickly than we would in a non equal case because of the federal law requirements. <coughs> Adoptive placement preferences. There are three of them. Child's extended family first, other members of the child's tribe, <coughs> other Indian families. Equal placement preferences, very specific tribal members for the second and third placement preference. I mentioned good cause to, to avoid the, the application of, of the equal placement preferences. Excuse me, and Shirley uh, touched on that as well. If you have a family living in Lincoln, Nebraska, and their tribe is in Alaska, and all of their extended family is in Alaska, all of the placement preferences, or all of the potential placements within preferences may be in Alaska. But if we take that family from, if we take that child from Lincoln, we're not going to be able to do supervised visitation every day with mom and dad. It, it's not, or even every week. Close, pro, close proximity to the home is what the ICWA says. But the fact that everybody within the placement preferences is distant may be good cause not to place within preferences. We had a child who came into care with seven fractures who was a tribal member. Um, and the child needed to be close to Children's Hospital for medical care. The doctor said with these fractures, this child cannot ride in a car seat for extensive periods of time. We placed the child in a foster home close to Children's Hospital um, until the fractures healed, and then we looked at the placement preferences after that. Um, <coughs> so that may be good cause, medical needs of the child. If you have a child who comes into care who is on an apnea monitor and very often stops breathing and none of the family members are, are trained to deal with the apnea monitor or CPR or something like that, that may be good cause not to place within the placement preferences until we have a family member who's trained to respond to the child's medical needs. Or if we have a child who needs to be placed in a home with a nurse, 24-7 nursing care, that may be good cause. But it should only be used in very rare, very limited circumstances. Um, I think we could do, in many cases, a better job at <coughs> finding placement within placement preferences. Celeste Hunter Michael, who is the Winnebago Tribes Equa Specialist for many years, said, if you do an extensive family <coughs> search, you will never have to go outside of the placement preferences. And I think that's pretty true in most of the cases. But we need to get those, those family searches done up front. I've seen family trees that have been done by, service, by case managers that take up four or five sheets of paper and they go out to fourth and fifth cousins. And that's the extensive family search that I'm talking about. Not just grandparents or aunts and uncles, siblings of the parents. We need to look further than that when we're talking about placement with family. Tribe may adopt other preferences in the case of adoption. I have seen tribes specify non-Indian adoptive homes because the home was a home that was known to the child and the, the family was willing to work with the tribe. In probably 80 to 90 percent of our cases um, for Health and Human Services, we agree with the tribe <coughs> on what should happen. We have a plan that the tribe agrees with or the tribe has helped us write a plan for this family. Uh, it's, it's the other cases that we may need to work out through the court system. And very often our disagreements are not major disagreements, they're, they're um, disagreements that we can work through. The Indian Child Welfare Acts talk about burden of proof evidentiary standards in equal cases. To place a child in foster care or to terminate parental rights, there must be a finding that continued custody by the parent or Indian custodian is likely to result in serious emotional or physical damage to the child. That should also be an allegation in the petition. There are, There is a case in Nebraska case law that says that there has to be equal language in the petition but it doesn't explain what that equal language is. The petition should allege that the child may be an Indian child. The petition should allege that continued custody by the parent or Indian custodian is likely to result in serious emotional or physical damage <coughs> to the child, and that active efforts have been provided and proved unsuccessful. 
those are the three areas that I see that should be alleged in the petition. The court needs to enter that finding of continued custody. And there, there was, there is case law in Nebraska that talks about, well, the state statute language for non equa cases is very close to the equal language. And the, the court, the appellate court that heard that case said, no, it's not enough. It needs to be that equa specific language. For placement in foster care, there needs to be clear and convincing evidence of that continued custody um, being harmful. For termination of parental rights, the burden is beyond a reasonable doubt. Really high burden. The only other time that it's ever used is when we're convicting somebody of a criminal offense. Placement in foster care and termination of parental <coughs> rights require the testimony of an expert witness. There was a case that came out on May 11th, um, Nebraska Court of Appeals case, that, that differentiated between adjudication on a, on a 3A petition and placement in foster care. They said the adjudication follows state law standards. It's going to be by a preponderance of the evidence. We're not going to use clear and convincing evidence. But if we're going to place that child out of home, then we need to have <coughs> clear and convincing evidence of continued custody, um, that standard. So they differentiated between the adjudication and the placement in foster care. It is possible to have an adjudication without placing the child in foster care. An adjudication where the child remains in the home with parents and there are 24-7 services provided in the home, something along those lines. <coughs> um, that same decision, Emma J. also talked about active efforts and testimony of a qualified expert witness. In that particular case, there was expert witness testimony and there was a finding of active efforts at the temporary removal hearing, but not at the adjudication. And the Court of Appeals said you have to have it at the adjudication as well. They reversed and remanded on the active efforts and the lack of qualified expert witness testimony at the adjudication. I know for county attorneys who were saying, how do we provide an, a qualified expert witness at every hearing where we're, we're addressing out of home custody? It can be a burden. <coughs> um, I'm working to develop qualified <coughs> expert witnesses who are tribal members. I've been doing a lot of training statewide. Um, with tribal members to serve as qualified expert witnesses because I think that, that a tribal member and, and the department is, is administration is backing this. The BIA guidelines talk about qualified expert witnesses and they set three, per, three the persons with the following criteria are more <coughs> likely to be qualified expert witnesses. Number one, a member of the child's tribe who's familiar with child rearing practices and family, family organization. Number two is an Indian it is a person who has delivered social services to Indians and familiar with the child's tribe. Number three is a lay person, <coughs> is a professional person with expertise in the area of his or her specialty. Um, there's been some litigation about that. Um, the court said that a case manager with 11 years of experience and a bachelor's degree in human development is not a qualified expert witness. That, that person doesn't fit the professional person standard. But um, a, Evelyn Labodi, who worked for CCFL, the Center for Children, Families, and the Law, trained the new workers for the Department of Health and Human Services and has 30 years of experience in researching Indian child welfare, is a qualified expert witness. Um, I, I think there's room for more litigation there, and it probably will happen in the future. But we have to have that qualified expert witness testimony to place a child in foster care <coughs> and to terminate parental rights. Questions about that? It's an area where there's been a lot of discussion lately. Um, intervention. When a tribe files a motion to intervene, that simply means that they want to be a part of the state court case. After the, the court has said that the tribe is allowed to intervene, then the tribe become, is a party to the case. They can call and cross-examine witnesses. They can present evidence. They have a right to notice of all of the court proceedings. Any other party, it, any rights that any other party has in the case, mom or dad, um, through their attorneys, the tribe has that same right. Trans 
transfer to a tribal court <coughs> is different from intervention. There's a, a case in Scott's Bluff. Um, it's a reported decision. I believe it's Sabriani of B. Uh, where the Oglala Sioux tribe filed a motion to intervene. And the judge and all of the attorneys in that case <coughs> treated it as a motion to transfer. The Court of Appeals talked about that in their opinion. They said, you know, the tribal only wanted to intervene, but everybody treated it as a motion to transfer. And then the Court of Appeals affirmed the denial of transfer. Why the Court of Appeals ruled on something that nobody had ever asked for, I don't know. It didn't make sense to me, but they did. Um, so intervention and transfer are two com completely separate things. When a case is transferred to a tribal court, the legal proceedings are transferred to the tribal court. That doesn't automatically mean that the child is going to be removed from the foster home that he or she has been in for three years. We've had a number of cases where the tribe maintains the children in the same foster home that they've been in. Um, I know that the state of North Dakota has an agreement with the tribe where the legal proceedings are transferred, but the state maintains fiscal responsibility for the case throughout the case. Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services has 4E agreements with the Omaha, the Winnebago, and the Santee Sioux. So if a case is 4E eligible when it's in the state court system, that 4E eligibility follows the case to the Omaha Tribal Court, Winnebago Tribal Court, or Santee Sioux Nation's Tribal Court. But if the case is not 4E eligible because the court didn't have the correct wording, the contrary to the welfare of the child language in, in the initial court order, or because there was something else wrong with the case from the very beginning, then when it's transferred to the tribal court, it's not 4E eligible either. So that prevents a lot of cases from being transferred to tribal courts because tribes don't have the resources to support their, their children in out of home maintenance in many cases. Some tribes do. There are a few, I would say less than Less than 5% <coughs> of the federally recognized tribes probably have all of the resources that they need. Um, not all tribes have casinos. The tribes that do have casinos, <coughs> they may be owned and or managed by somebody other than the tribe. Um, and then there are, there are situations like the Omaha Tribes Casino that recently closed. They had a federal court decision that said that all of the profits from their casino for 10 years were going to go to a management company that managed the casino years before. Uh, sometimes those things wind up in federal litigation. Um, when a case is transferred to a tribal court, the state court and Health and Human Services close their case file. If the tribe wants to make a, an agreement with the foster family uh, to continue to have the children placed there, that's up to the tribe and the foster family. We can help facilitate some of those discussions um, but it, ultimately it is up to the tribe, and the tribe gets to make decisions about that case, that family, from that point on. Questions about intervention or transfer? Um, Jerry? Yes. I'm glad you brought that up a lot ago because that always happens when you intervene. They think that the, the parties might think that transfer is best interest of the child. Mm -hmm. And best interest of the child is so important. It, 
it's the reason why, why collaboration is so important, because the tribe's determination of best interest of the child may be different from the state's determination of the best interest of the child. We need to work together on those issues. We need to determine the best interest. We want to know what the tribe believes is in the best interest of the child and work together to provide that for the child and for the family. And I can help with those if you have family team meetings or if you have um, family group conferencing or something like that. If you need me to be available for those, I, I'm more than willing to help. We're, we're, and all, another thing too is I always tell parents when they get really, you know, we, we're really, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you are still victimized, but with, when these parents are in their, um, <clears throat> whatever state they are, when the child gets removed and they're in denial of their responsibility if, they have, if it hasn't been adjudicated, you know, they look at ways to manipulate to try to think which way it's going to be easier. And um, so it's really overwhelming, you know, for us when we get those calls, but to really, you know, mm -hmm. attorneys to explain to them the legal aspects of what they're involved in rather than what's the quickest way to get this to the tribe. Or, you know, I mean, we get a lot of it. I, mean, <coughs> you know, I don't think we get that much in Nebraska, but we get a lot of it in South Dakota. And then um, the other part I wanted to bring up about that, um, let's see, the transfer, is that, you know, the parent does have that right to object. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you have like a, um, that, that needs to be understood because sometimes you think that's an automatic given to it. Um, uh, let, me, let me talk to the objection. Under the federal law and Nebraska law, if either parent objects to transfer to the tribal court, the case automatically stays in the state court. Doesn't matter why the parent's objecting, but if, the, if the, one of the parents objects, it stays in the state court. If anybody else objects, then the case, the, the objection needs to be in writing, filed with the court, and the party seeking the transfer has a right to respond. There was a case in Dakota County, Nebraska, where I represented the Ho-Chunk Nation. I was working for legal aid at the time, and I was associated as local counsel. Um, the guardian ad litem in that case just happened to be a, a tribal court judge. The guardian ad litem objected to the transfer to the Ho-Chunk Nation's tribal court because of the distance between Dakota County, Nebraska, and Wisconsin, where the Ho-Chunk Nation is, the tribal court is located. Guardian ad litem said it was an inconvenient forum the, the state uh, HHS worker should not be required to go to the tribal court to testify. Um, the Ho-Chunk Nation does have a lot of resources, and they sent a judge, a social worker, and an attorney to Dakota County, Nebraska, and they made arrangements with the Winnebago tribe to use the Winnebago tribal court to adjudicate the case. The guardian ad litem withdrew her objections, and the case was transferred and handled in the Winnebago tribal court. The social worker for the tribe basically moved in with the parents 12 to 14 hours a day. The allegations were that the parents were not properly supervising this four-year-old child who had a mouthful of cavities because they were feeding her pop and candy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, through the social worker, a lot of good things were done with that family to provide nutrition and education and to provide proper parenting te techniques to the family. It was, it was a situation, a case that worked out very, very well. But the guardian and the proper procedure was followed. The guardian of Leiden filed her objections in writing, and the tribe had the opportunity to respond. The Omaha tribal court judge has said that he will convene his courtroom anywhere in Nebraska so that he the proceedings are closer to the family um, in a case where, where a case is transferred. We have had tribal courts that have gone to other states. I believe one from Nebraska went to Texas to convene in a Texas state court um, courtroom to allow proceedings to be held close. But there are a number of reasons for objection to a transfer, but sometimes we can mitigate those objections. Um, the, the other issue that you touched on that I, I want to uh, expand on a little bit is there, there's a misconception by some people that tribes are automatically going to do what the parents want them to do. And that's not the case. Tribes are independent from parents. There are some tribes that, that will uh, um, be effective advocates for their parents in all situations, and some tribes will say, wait a minute, this, this is not appropriate parenting. Most of the tribes will tell parents that, that whatever they're doing is not appropriate parenting, and the things need to be done to change that. Um, I walked into a courtroom in Platte County, Nebraska, involving a Santee child, 
um, where the child had been playing in the middle of a four-lane highway, we were dealing with a four-year-old, and the law enforcement brought the child back to the parents' home. Mom was working at the time, and uncle was supposed to be babysitting. Um, law enforcement left the child with the uncle. That same afternoon, law enforcement found the same child playing in the middle of the same street and removed the child and got in touch with the department for, for emergency <coughs> placement and foster care. When I went into the courthouse to represent the tribe, the judge in that particular case wanted to know, uh, or wanted to dismiss the case, and so did the Health and Human Services case manager. The tribe said, wait a minute, we have evidence that mom is using methamphetamine, and this child twice in the same day was playing in the middle of the street unsupervised. We don't want this child being returned home. We don't want this case dismissed. The judge wanted the tribe to take over the case. At that time, the tribe didn't have a tribal court, so they had no way of transferring a case to the tribe. That's, that's one of the, the automatic objections um, that, that, under the BIA guidelines, gives reason to <coughs> not transferring a case if the tribe doesn't have a tribal court. And some tribes still, still don't. Uh, for whatever reason. Some tribes have a circle of elders that determines child welfare cases. Um, some tribes have very westernized tribal courts. But all tribes, they, they vary. Um, but tribes don't want their children left in unsafe positions either. Yes? Are tribes given the freedom to make their courts however they see fit? Like they don't have to have <coughs> education or schooling or Tribes are sovereign nations, so they're allowed to enact their own laws and follow their own laws. The four tribal courts where I practice, where I have practiced, Omaha, Winnebago, Santee Sioux, and Ponca, all have their own tribal codes. There are some elements of the tribal codes that are adopted from state case law, um, such as due process, notice, and who can serve papers and things like that. Um, but very similar to state states. Um, but there are other things, for example, in the Omaha <coughs> Tribal Code, if you are, um, if, if you're the mother of young children and um, filing for custody of, of your children against the father, no, no allegations of abuse and neglect, <coughs> um, the mother of young children is preferred for placement uh, or for custody of children, for young children for Omaha, the Omaha Tribe. Um, that's the only tribe that I know that has enacted that code, but that's customary and traditional for the Omaha tribe. It's also something that, that state courts in, in the United States followed for a number of years, but that's now shifted. I have successfully represented fathers in the, the Omaha tribal court. If I represent dad and um, mom is represented by an attorney, uh, the, the tribal code says, if all things are equal, if I represent dad, I'm going to show the court that all things are not equal. Um, that my client deserves custody for whatever reasons. So the judges, the tribal judges, might not necessarily have gone to law school? That's possible. Okay. That's possible. <coughs> um, my introduction to the Omaha Tribal Court, Judge Tony Mathis, is the juvenile court judge now. He is not law trained. He has served at various times as public defender for the Omaha Tribe. He um, in the early 1980s was the equal <coughs> specialist for the state of Nebraska. Um, he, he's done a number of legal roles for the Omaha tribe, and most tribal codes allow for the practice of lay advocates. Tribal courts very often don't have the resources to have attorneys practicing in all of their courts. Um, in many tribal courts, you find that the only people who are licensed to pra practice there are the tribe's attorneys, the the prosecutor or presenting officer, and the public defender. There may not be anybody else who's licensed to practice there, so you may have lay advocates um, who are presenting their own cases. Probably 80 to 95 percent of the cases in tribal courts, people are unrepresented. They, they present their own cases. And it's a different system. It's a restorative justice system. Um, one of the examples, I, I don't want to stray too far from child welfare, <coughs> A friend of mine was practicing in the White Mountain Apache Court, and he represented a criminal defendant. Um, there was an exchange of words between the attorney and the judge, and then there was um, some talk in the Apache native language between the defendant and the judge. And then the attorney took over, who did not speak the language, and said, Your Honor, my, my client enters a plea of not guilty. 
And the judge looked at the attorney and said, really? He just told me that he did it. <laughs> um, different system of justice, <coughs> different understanding. Um, let's, let's admit the wrongdoing, restore to balance and harmony <coughs> and move on is what, what you often find in tribal courts. Uh, earlier you mentioned of a grandmother guardian, or a guardianship from a tribal court. This is a full faith and credit provision um, to public acts, records, and judicial proceedings. One of the public acts are, tribal, are customary and traditional adoptions. Adoption of a child by somebody who, who is not the biological parents. Um, no documentation. We still need to give full faith and credit to those types of proceedings. Appointment of counsel, um, Indian child, parent of an Indian child, Indian custodian have a right to <coughs> court appointed counsel where the court determines indigency. The court may appoint counsel for the child, um, so you may have a guardian of litem and an attorney for the child. Appointment of counsel for the tribe is not required. There was a case in Nebraska where the Ponca tribe attempted to file a motion to intervene in a case in Dakota County. Dakota County judge said, wait a minute, the, the Ponca tribe's ICWA specialist is not an attorney. Under Nebraska law, only an attorney can file pleadings. Would not allow the pleading to be filed. Uh, the Ponca tribe appealed that decision and the Nebraska Supreme Court said that tribes can be represented by non-attorneys and they, may allow, they are allowed to fully participate in all proceedings. The ICWA specialist for the tribe can um, call and cross-examine witnesses just as any other attorney would be able to. I think the other way to handle that would have been to allow the court to appoint counsel for the tribe in every case where the tribe didn't have an attorney. Most tribes don't have the resources to hire attorneys in all 50 states. Um, if you're an attorney and you practice law, if you're licensed to practice law in Nebraska, that doesn't mean that you're licensed to practice law in other states. And if you're charged with practicing law without a license, that gives the state where you are licensed to practice a reason to take away your license to practice law. So the penalties can be re really high. Um, and I know that that has been an argument. The Winnebago tribe's attorney had an Oklahoma case open and the judge asked her if she was an attorney. And she said, Your Honor, I'm not an attorney licensed to practice in the state of Oklahoma. I'm here representing the tribe. I just happen to have a law education. Um, so those, those arguments continue. The cases for the states where it has been decided and, uh, or ha has been argued, Oregon, Iowa, and now Nebraska, all three allow non-attorneys to represent tribes. Most often, ICWA specialists from tribes in cases in Nebraska are not going to be attorneys. But they're very, very often the person who knows about the most about the Indian Child Welfare Act in the court knows more than the attorneys and the judges because they've been doing this for so long, in many cases. Every party, including tribes, in a foster care or termination of parental rights proceeding has a <coughs> right to examine reports or other documents filed with the court. That doesn't mean that the tribal representative gets to go through the Health and Human Services file. There are legal communications that go back and forth between the case manager and HHS legal that the tribe cannot have access to. Uh, there may be a psychological evaluation in the HHS file that has not been filed with the court. And HIPAA, another federal law, pro prohibits the department from releasing that to anybody. But if it's been filed with the court, if it's attached to the court report, then the tribe gets to have a copy of it. <coughs> We've had a lot of questions about release of information and what information can be released. Most of it can be. Yes, sure. That's something that's uh, rarely given to us if we get a notice sometimes the attachments and if we're involved with this intervene and recognize. Uh, it seems like the only time I get those is when I go to court. And you have a right to have those. If they've been mailed out to the parties and you have intervened in the proceedings, you should be on the mailing list of all of the, the documents that are filed in the court. Because well, I think specifically I'm, I'm thinking about Lincoln where they'll say attached, <coughs> attached. And then I notice when I go to court and I ask the judge and then I'll get a copy of that. It's not 
Well, and if you've traveled yeah. six or eight hours to get to a hearing in Lincoln, you don't want to ask for a continuance because you haven't been given a copy of the court report. I understand that. There are logistical challenges to compliance or, or to mandating compliance with the Indian Child Welfare yeah. Act for, for tribal representatives. Um, in those cases, if you want to contact me, I would be more than happy to help and try to make sure that we facilitate the, the process of getting people work to you, whatever the documents are. When the department went to um, <coughs> trying to have more voluntary cases, we, we have 70% of the children in out-of-home care, 30% in-home, and we're trying to flip that around so that we have 30% in out-of-home care and 70% being provided services in-home. A lot of talk was, was about ICWA cases, consent to voluntary placement. What do we have to do? Well, even if a petition has not been filed in court, a consent to placement has to be before a judge, has to be in writing. The judge has to certify that the terms and consequences of that consent to placement <coughs> were fully explained to the parent or Indian custodian and that they were under, fully understood by the parent or Indian custodian. It must be in a language that the parent understands. So if the parent's first language is Navajo, we need to have a Navajo interpreter in the court. Um, same thing with the consent to termination of parental rights or relinquishment. If you have a relinquishment of a parent, of, a, of an Indian child, whether that parent is Indian or non-Indian, has to be in court, has to follow the same, same guidelines here. <clears throat> and I want to go back to that for just a second. Do we have anybody here who um, deals with private adoptions? If we have a child, uh, a private adoption going forward of an Indian child, the, the relinquishment of the parents must be after the child is at least 10 days old or it's not valid. I know it creates some problems. There are a couple of states that say that the relinquishment must occur within three days or seven days of the birth of the child. ICWA says the child has to be at least 10 days old or it's not valid. I would hate to have a private adoption go forward, have the child in an adoptive placement or an adoptive home for three years, and then have somebody step in and say, wait a minute, my consent wasn't valid. I want to uh, vacate, I want the adoption vacated. It has happened in other states, not in Nebraska that I know of. Is that, I know it says consent to voluntary placement, mm -hmm. is that in voluntary placement as well? Um, the child must be at least 10 days old, yes. That so, consent section uh, applies to both voluntary placement and terminations of parental rights. But we're yes. not, for voluntary placement, are we talking about the non-court cases that we have? Or, yes. Okay. So if a child goes into the hospital and tests positive for cocaine or drugs or something, mm -hmm. uh, does the child stay in the hospital for those 10 days? How does that look? And we... I've been involved in cases where we have uh, a young lady placed at YRTC and gives birth and she can't take the child back to YRTC with her because she's going back to YRTC when, she, when the baby is two or three days old. She can't validly give a consent to placement until that child is 10 days old. What do we do? Um, we're working through those cases one at a time and we're allowing that mother to give her consent to somebody watching the child or we may be going into court when that child is two days old and making the court aware of what's going on and the mother saying, yes, I'll allow this foster parent to uh, care for the <coughs> child while I'm, while I'm returning to IRTC and then doing the consent to placement after the child is 10 days old. We may need to do an emergency removal until the child is 10 days old. Yes? What's the point of the 10-day-old thing? Because there were a lot of Indian parents in the 1960s who were signing away their parental rights and not knowing they were doing that mm -hmm. or having many regrets later because they were promised all kinds of things and then all of a sudden those promises didn't materialize and, and <coughs> the baby's two weeks old, hey wait a minute, I don't have my child, I didn't get what I was promised, I don't think that my child is safe or, or in an appropriate home. Uh, so it, it allows some time for some 
cold, sober reflection on what <coughs> happened. Um, and, and maybe for some of those culturally appropriate support services and family members too. If you're a young mom and you've just given birth to a child, the first 10 days after birth is not a time that you want to be making decisions. <coughs> The Indian Child Welfare Act says that if a parent or Indian custodian consents to foster care and then withdraws their consent, that the child shall be returned upon demand. Um, in cases where, where the department believes that the child is not going to be safe, law enforcement may be asked to step in to remove that child. So if mom consents to voluntary placement, two weeks later she says, no, I want my child back. Is mom still using math? Uh, is the child safe? Is there something that the department can do to provide in-home safety services to ensure the safety of the child? If a parent or Indian custodian withdraws their consent to relinquishment or to the adoption, um, the federal and state law both say that the consent may be withdrawn prior to the entry of a final decree of termination of parental rights or adoption. In every relinquishment hearing that I have ever attended, and that's been a few dozen in Nebraska courts, judges tell parents that they have the right to withdraw their, their consent, their relinquishment, up to the point of adoption. They bypass that final decree of termination. I think that when, when a parent relinquishes on the record and the court, the court um, explains and certifies the terms and conditions of the relinquishment and enters that order, that's the final decree of termination. But I'm not seeing that in Nebraska state courts at all. Um, if, if a judge has told a parent on the record that they can withdraw the, their consent up to the adoption and adoptive parents challenge it, um, saying that the parent only had a right to withdraw up to a termination of their parental rights, a relinquishment of their parental rights. Um, it can provide for instability for the child. It, it's a threat to permanency for the child. What is the Nebraska law as far as adoption goes? How long the parent has to, to say that they want to have the child? Or how long does that occur after that initial court hearing? Is it six? I know some states it's six months. The parent saying no, I don't want to adopt. What is the as far how long does a parent have to withdraw their relinquishment yeah. after they relinquish? Right. I don't no time at all. The, the private attorneys in the room, county attorneys, when they relinquish, that's a final relinquishment. They don't have the right to withdraw that that relinquishment. I'm seeing heads nod. Okay. But for the parent of an Indian child, um, relinquishment up to the point of the final decree of termination or adoption. Return of custody, we have had some of these cases. If an adoption is vacated or the adoptive parents relinquish their parental rights, the biological parent or the former Indian custodian may petition for the return of the child. That doesn't mean that we're automatically going to get the child back. The court shall grant the return unless it's not in the best interest of the child. This is the only time that the best interest is used in the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, it's, it's up to the court based upon whatever evidence is presented to the, to the court. I have been involved in proceedings where there have been, where there's been an adoption vacated or adoptive parents have relinquished and bio parents adopt their own biological children. Um, sometimes it takes parents five or six years to get their act together if they're, they're using substances. Um, but I have seen <coughs> biological parents successfully rehabilitate and successfully parent their children as, as their children get older. Doesn't happen very often, but it's possible. <coughs> Record of placement. Um, the state must maintain a record of placement, and we do that through an end focus. We must show the efforts to comply with the placement preferences. 
the Secretary of the Interior or the child's tribe can request a copy of the placements of the child and our efforts to place within the preferences. Um, if we do that, we, we must release that information to the tribe. States and tribes can enter into agreements uh, for the care and custody of their children. When a state court is aware that a child has been improperly removed, they must decline jurisdiction. So if a judge is aware that law enforcement removed a child and there was not imminent physical <coughs> danger, the court must decline uh, jurisdiction over that child. We don't want children going back to unsafe uh, circumstances. I mentioned earlier that the higher standard applies. If there's a higher standard in state law uh, than in federal law, then the state law would apply. If the higher standard is in federal law, then the federal law would apply. Record keeping. If you look at the back page of the Federal Indian Child Welfare Act, it talks about the record keeping, the, the, it talks about the court providing a copy of an adoption decree to the Secretary of the Interior. If you have an Indian child who has been adopted, then the court is responsible for providing that, that documentation to, to the Department of the Interior. And it lists the information that must be provided. Out of all 50 states, there is only one state that's in compliance with this provision, and it's not Nebraska, uh, not any of the middle states. <coughs> if someone asks the Secretary of the Interior, not, not Health and Human Services, but the Secretary <coughs> of the Interior, must disclose the information to specific in individuals, child over the age of 18, adoptive parents, foster parents, guardians, to protect the rights or benefits associated with the child's membership in the tribe. Some state courts um, are more open, and there is another provision of the Indian Child Welfare Act that says that the, that the court can provide that information to the child or, or limited other parties. I've been involved in requesting adoption records. There was a case where a father was adopted in the state of Oregon, and uh, department legal contacted the court in Oregon where the father had been adopted and within three hours we had all of the adoption records faxed to us uh, to show the, the father's affiliation <coughs> with his tribe and to allow us to prove the child's tribal affiliations. But I've also been in, involved in a case in Nebraska where the mother was adopted in Nebraska and the Nebraska court refused to provide any of the information from the mother's adoption when it went to litigation. Um, I left legally before the case was resolved, so I don't know how that case wound up, but I know that there were seven or eight months worth of proceedings, um, and, and legally it was still fighting to get those records open to prove the mother's tribal affiliations. <coughs> There are two different provisions in the Indian Child Welfare Act that talk about um, what can be done if there are violations of the Indian Child Welfare Act. And the first one is really not violations of the Indian Child Welfare Act. It's if a parent is coerced into providing consent to an adoption or relinquishing parental rights, and the consent is based upon fraud or duress, then the parent has up to two years to ask the court to vacate the adoption or return the child. There was a case in Nebraska, uh, Kenton H, K-E-N-T-E-N, -E last initial, or surname initial H, where um, there was a petition to vacate an adoption based upon fraud or duress. In that particular case, <coughs> the mother had been involved with the department, and, and this is not confidential information, it's information that's reported in the decision the mother had been involved with the department for some time with older children. She went to the hospital and gave birth to a new child. And the case manager, according to the opinion, went into the courtroom while the mother was, um, was under the influence of morphine and other good drugs. Um, the mother relinquished her parental rights to the baby. And the mother was promised that if she relinquished her rights to the baby, that 
uh, the county attorney would not seek a termination of parental rights to her older children. Sounds like some fraud and duress may be going on in that <coughs> case, and um, that, that's, that was one of the basis for appeals. The case was reversed and remanded on other grounds, so that the court never got to rule on the issues, but that's, that's an example of fraud and duress. The mother was promised, uh, that's, it's at least duress to promise a mother who is on morphine that the, that the county attorney is not going to seek termination of, of her parental rights if she relinquishes really her rights to a baby. I, I certainly think that's duress. But the court never had the opportunity to rule on it. The teeth that the Indian Child Welfare Act has for um, for violations of the Indian Child Welfare Act is a petition to invalidate. And the petition to invalidate can be filed at any time. If there are violations of jurisdiction, notice, intervention, transfer, full faith and credit, appointment of counsel, access to documents in the court's file, active efforts, burdens of proof, expert witness testimony, and consent. Any of those provisions, if there are violations, that anybody involved in the case, mom, dad, tribe, Indian custodian, can ask the court to invalidate everything that's happened in that case from the point of the violation forward. If we have a, an adjudication on a 3A petition, an adjudication to place a child in foster care, three years later we have a termination of parental rights and then an adoption, and an attorney for mom comes in and says, you know, at the adjudication, when you were petitioning to place the children in foster care, my tribe wasn't notified. I want you to, it, to invalidate everything while well, the tribe comes in. The tribe is an in innocent party. They've never received notification in, on the case. The tribe comes in and says, I want you in, to invalidate everything that's happened. That ha can and has happened. Um, we don't want to see those things happen. We want to see the equal compliance right up front, make sure that that happens. Um, get it on the record, get the notices out the way that we're supposed to deal with, with things um, in compliance with the Indian Child Welfare Act. And finally, thank you. Thank you for your attention today. Um, you have the power to protect a child, whether that's an Indian child or a non-Indian child. And I'm more than willing to take questions. Um, sure. I have a few. Um, Sherry, I wanted to, um, I saw this nice little book that goes through, um, I don't know if all the parents get that, this explained. Because a lot of times when the parents get into the system, they're just like, you know, just, I mean, aside from whatever the incident is, you know, they're, it's different from criminal court or uh, another court that they're familiar with. Um, one of the questions I have is, um, on your notices, the first thing that we'll get a parent to be like up in arms about is that line of a possible termination of their rights. Mm -hmm. Somewhere on that notice that they, and this is nationwide, it's not only the Nebraska and South Dakota. And by the way, it was the other day we had a family come in from here, and I'm sure they had to borrow the gas money to come, they went to court, and whatever, whatever they got from that judge. And every one of the judges nationwide, whatever room they have, you know, I don't want to say they're like God, but they just, it depends on how you, they have their own protocol mm -hmm. where they scared these parents and you know aside from the incident that they were um you know they're going to try it for so i i don't i don't know if you guys already have your notice of standardized but it would really be nice if this termination sends lines you know right here it says maybe required um 15 out of the last 22 months and but i would say that you have a but that's way down you know the, the trail before so that's something that really scares them and, I mean, I've had them come from Lincoln. We would kind of show up, and I always think of what, you know, why couldn't you get that resolved down there and put it on the baby answer? Mm -hmm. So that's one comment I'd like to make. And then another one is um, there's really been a lot of changes in the equal law from when it came about in the 70s. It's been also fortunate to hear the author member in the city of Iowa when the Iowa mm -hmm. law became, uh, what is his name again? Um, the guy came from out east and did that presentation. Bert Hirsch? Yeah, he did, if, if you ever had a chance to hear him and how this came about, it was a lot of things, you know. Mm -hmm. And then if you've ever, if you ever heard Judge Thorne on the other side of it talk about some more, you know, mm -hmm. of the aspects of this law and, and, and me being a social worker in the field, I've really learned a lot. But, you know, I always say that I don't think anybody perceived that in 220, and today that 
the amount of children, I don't think they thought that many children of our tribe would be in care. Mm -hmm. It was a big difference in the 70s and, and 2000. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, my mother, a voluntary doctor, <coughs> a sibling, and we didn't know she was raised, you know, I lived uh, in the Martin, South Dakota area. We never knew she was raised between Hyannis and Martin. So when the other, um, there was actually about four of them adopted your family. And when um, the mother of the other child that was 18 came back and said, I, I come back to tell you who I am, she said, well, do you know my family? She said, yeah, this is their last name and look in the phone book in Martin. So that's how she found us. And so, so you know, when you talk about the split feather syndrome, there's a lot of pros and cons of everything. You know, <coughs> some of our, some of our, our children were adopted and, and they come back and, and they want to say, um, you know, there's a violation, but on the other hand, some of them are well-educated, well-dressed, you know, had a lot of good opportunities that we didn't have, you know, that we weren't in that. But my sister cho cho chooses, no matter what, to be in the world, and I've offered her to be a part of our world, but she's got a Mexican father who has the same mother. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting to see this played out, you know, from that era, because I would have been in probably in the mid-50s when I was done. And, mm -hmm. um, but anyway, just like, you know, to really think about the change that has happened to our people in that era, which is really sad, you know, just like the majority of the other society has been affected by addictions, you know, our people have two of them. Mm -hmm. um, and the one thing about the culture plan that I feel really important is to find relatives that are healthy, that can have that connection. So, you know, that we were probably maybe 40 miles from each other. She could have got to know my grandfather, you know, a lot of our elders in our family that really you know, had a lot to offer. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and then also, too, that you, you keep talking about culture, but another piece is spiritual. We also have our spirituality that's not just culture, you know. Mm -hmm. And I say that with a lot of pride for my own son, who was seven years at home in Tennessee. Um, you know, he went to AA route. He went all these, but when he started to find out more about himself spiritually, he wants his language, he's singing. That's a really inherent part of our, of our heart. That, you know, that, and I'm real proud to see that because it, it, it's making him a, a different person and he's going to you know, have a lot to offer to people. Mm -hmm. Then I also have another question. How many cases that have gone <coughs> to, um, have, have ever, have gone to trial for adjudications and what are the outcomes? How many cases have gone to adjudication? Or a trial, rather than just a you know, rather than a Rather than a plea? Yeah. Um, I think it varies by county, and I think there are a number of parents' attorneys who are not taking enough of the cases to trial. It's, it's easier to convince your client to accept a plea and to move forward. And there are parents who don't want to go to trial because they know that they can access service fa services faster and have their children return to them faster. So every child, every family, every case is going to be different and have a little bit different <coughs> twist to it. Um, unique circumstances. I, I want to go back to the notice that you were talking about. The Code of Federal Regulations requires that we include in the notice that the, the outcome of the proceedings may permanently affect the rights of the parents and the Indian custodians. So that's, that's ICWA and, and ICWA compliance. We have to have that um, language to that effect in the notices. The 15 of the 22 months is asked for the Adoption and Safe Families Act, and another federal law. Um, that's not required in ICWA notices, but what, what our case managers have found statewide <coughs> is that if parents know you have 15 months to get your act together, you have 15 months to remedy the problems in this case, and if you haven't moved forward, we have this federal law that's going to apply that says that we need to do something, that we need, the county attorney may need to file a petition to terminate parental rights after your child has been out of your home for 15 months. There are exceptions to that. If the child is placed with extended family, if the department has not complied with the Indian Child Welfare Act, um, extenuating circumstances. So every case is going to be a little bit different, but even under the Adoption and Safe Families Act, there are some of those exceptions that could very well apply to the Indian Child Welfare Act um, cases that, that are in the court system. Other questions? Shirley, thank you for your comments, because it's, it's, it's been really important to hear those and 
it, it brings to mind a lot of the, the work that I've done with tribal members and cases involving tribal children. Every case is different, and, and we need to consider that child and that family and the environment they're in, whether they're urbanized or whether they're, they're very closely traditional and spiritual. Everyone's different. We're really, um, we're available, although we're really under, you know, we really are understaffed or due to our guests, and, and we do go to some uh, some of these meetings where we try to go, you know, to, to do the best we can. Is, uh, you know, there are just two of us, you know, I'm the, every tribe just has one designated equal person, and I'm that person, and we're under the um, contract with two men also. But even if you need it, um, you know, like a little mini, um, workshop or service to your office, you know, we're, we're willing to come and don't ever be scared to ask, you know, a question that you think might be, you know, stupid because I might want to ask you something too, you know, <laughs> but, you know. It, I've it, asked it, all the stupid questions. <laughs> <laughs> and, it is, and it is really hard to do this work, you know, I mean, I took it to the end and I was going to um, help to do a, help review this program and get it back on it and move on and for some reason I'm still here at 10, almost 10 years in December. And it's really, really a tough job because depending on the political administrations, you know, we might get, you know, we're really fortunate recently we haven't had, sometimes we'll have that parent that will come back and go to the consul and then just, you know, we just, you know, we're bound by the Privacy Act, we can't say something, but I shouldn't even say that, better not, because, um, you know, we, you know, we'll have a case that will just get into turmoil and we just needed all that communication and you know, on the understanding. Um, we had a really unique case in Michigan that, that surprised us, you know. Uh, Bernie went to court. I, you know, I can't go to all the courts, so I'll do the intention, but she traveled on the case for us a few <coughs> years ago where the judge, where we had all the parties really supporting this non-Indian placement and that this relative was in Idaho. And just because she didn't have certain uh, resources to get there or come forward, but we were able to help pay for her to get over there. And she did give her sister's child and, and got through that pregnancy and it was really amazing how we kind of had to fight that. But then, then just in this past year, we had another parent that was in prison and got his rights terminated and he got out. And he just did his own social work. He got himself enrolled and found his adopted mother. It was sad. It was sad. You know, he didn't have a beautiful reunion, but he got enrolled. And the judge went and overturned and gave him back his rights and scolded the workers and said, you better learn about the ICWA Act. So it was amazing to hear that we were in the middle of Towson. So there's really been some real good outcomes come because of the ICWA Act. Good. Thank you. And this is our day off. We had we got a day off for tribal <laughs> elder day. So we wanted to announce that we came to work and we really and we feel sad because we know Doug and we know some other people who work. And then we're just how many miles away and we, we don't see each other enough. But, um, we, we really wanted to short, you know, to let you know who we are and uh, thank you and the help and serve your own work that we do. And I, you did introduce Bernadette, right? Uh, I did say Bernadette's name. Bernadette Wilson. Yes. And thank she's you. my family preservation under our Title IV B grant. She works with me and she's really invaluable in some of the um, yeah, you know, you know, no one ever told us how to do all these forms. We have to ask <laughs> no, we got this one cover letter we've been using for 10 years because we haven't even changed it, you know, and so, you know what, and we, we don't have no legal advice. My children's court judge, Janelle Sully, when she has time, our attorney general, my full standing high when he has time, and Eric Anton, the tribal attorney, when he has time, so it's really difficult, and that's one thing we're dreaming of as an attorney to help us. Well, ICWA is that unique mix of law and social work. There is no mm -hmm. other law that's like ICWA. And it requires expertise in both if you work for a <coughs> other class. Other questions? Thoughts? Has this been helpful? Providing some information, good information. Don't be afraid to ask questions. I've never had somebody tell me that they don't have time. I've always had tribal representatives, especially when the time, um, with very, very few resources, and I've been blessed with, with a lot of good people in my life and a lot of good supports. Um, and I really appreciate you being here today and being committed to doing what's right for children and families. So thank you.